Well, uh, welcome. Uh, it's great to see you all here. Um, I'm so glad we moved from the Marshall Building because we were initially going to be in a big room. As you all know, I love little rooms like this. So this is perfect to see you all massed around us for this uh, Ukraine event, which we've advertised as as solutions. Uh, as solutions to Ukraine, though in fact all I have are 13 questions to offer you, uh, which I will do after um, Stephen speaks. So the rough order is, um, it's going to be Stephen Humphreys first on my right, and then I will speak, then Davika will speak, and we'll finish up with Mona, and then the general idea is to have a sort of discussion amongst us all about the current situation in Ukraine, I'll just make a preliminary remark, though, uh, before handing over to, to Stephen, which is that, in a way, um, we, we're in the phase, um, we're in the phase of a kind of uh, moral reckoning around the Ukraine, and the, uh, we're in the phase of getting people into this room, really, so let me, let me just, yeah, okay, is everyone seated? And, yeah, we're in the we're in a kind of a phase of thinking about Ukraine and speaking about Ukraine in sort of heavily moralistic or at least moral um, tones, and it's hard to get a purchase on the situation in other ways. So we're in the phase of what I think of as outrage, mm -hmm. and I think in a way in this outrageous phase or outrage phase, it's quite difficult to engage with Ukraine in a kind of long-range, disinterested, um, strategic, um, historical way. We're going to, going to try to do that today. I mean, I entirely appreciate why there is so much um, outrage, and I think international law is a, is a sort of accomplice to this outrage. It's become, a, in a way, a propagandist language. Uh, it, it, apply to Ukraine rather than a historical method or a mode of analysis. So we want to sort of break through this, this phase of outrage, and that's what we're going to try to do this evening, starting with uh, my yeah, dear well, colleague, Stephen Humphrey. Now you tell me. Yeah, now I know I tell you. Uh, um, yes, I don't think I'm exactly um, breaking through the uh, carapace of outrage as yet that uh, the events are. Like outrageous. So let me maybe do a zoom out thing, and by the time we get through the four of us, we will have zoomed into something much more rational and reasonable. <laughs> I'll start at the outside and present the broader case, and we'll see what we get. Um, two points, I guess, um, that I would make uh, at this juncture. Uh, I've been in the fortunate or unfortunate position of teaching the laws of war over the last term. While this has been going on, I see a number of people from my classes here. Um, it's been extraordinary. We've been able to discuss it as it's happened in the room. Uh, it's been very educational for me, uh, certainly. Um, three things that have come through for me in the course of those discussions. Um, I think we found it uncomfortable to have to speak about this at all. And there's various different ways in which it was. A first is the fact that speaking about the law of armed conflict in the context of what is an aggressive war, uh, makes a lot of what Russia is actually doing okay. It makes it lawful. Um, so the Russian army walks across the border, starts to kill people in uniform or anybody who resists, or bombs bridges that might be useful, or raises hilltops, and all of this is legal because a war has begun. Um, this is, of course, a well-known problem for the law of armed conflicts and the law of war, known to my students as the inviolable decoupling of use and um, from the use and ballot. Once a war starts, regardless of the reason, regardless of its lawfulness, lots of terrible, violent things become legal for an army that weren't legal the day before. Uh, of course, this is awful. And we all want to say it's a crime. And so we turn to the language of war crimes. We say it's a war crime. And there are certainly war crimes taking place in Ukraine. Uh, but lots of what Russia is doing there is not war. It is not criminal, you say it's war. It's not war criminal, it's simply war. Um, a second reason for discomfort we found is that the law of armed conflict creates a kind of moral equivalence between the two belligerent parties, as though they are both equally to blame. 
since they're both held to the same standards. So if we're looking out for war crimes by the Russians, we must also look out for war crimes by Ukrainians. Are Molotov cocktails a prohibited weapon, for example? Were they really parading Russian captives, which would be a violation of the law of armed conflict? After that, again, many of my students found it distressing, as did I, or even numbing, to use a word that was raised in class, that the law just doesn't seem to work. Countless reports of attacks on civilians day after day, but no real sense that any attention is being paid to the illegality of these acts. What does it say, I was asked, for a body of law that the moment it is called forth onto the international stage, it appears to be in violation? One person pointed out that it may not be the role of law, this law, the law of armed conflict, to do what it says on the tin, or not only, or not primarily. That instead we should think of it as a language of possibility and legitimacy. As well as the war waged on the ground in Ukraine, you might say, there is a discursive war, and that's being waged here in these rooms or in the media around the world. And the law of war is its language. From this perspective, I was almost relieved to hear that the Russian media has been claiming that Ukraine is faking the attacks on the theater and the hospital in Mariupol. Because if Russia wants us to believe these things haven't happened at all, they must agree that they shouldn't have happened or that there's something wrong with them. This, I think, is relieving because sometimes it has seemed as though there is a war underway against the law of war itself, against the language of war itself. I'm not sure that this language for war that we have is the best we can do, but at the moment, it's all we have. Um, and that takes me to a third observation about this war, which is that it's also an information war. So apparently there's a group called the Center for Resilient Information that has been examining satellite data, which they're getting from a group called Maxar Technologies, to verify the claims of attacks on civilians made by Ukrainians in order to combat the claims of falsification made by Russian media. And there is Russia's extraordinary law on fake news which covers anything that might be true. And there is a usual propaganda war being waged by NATO and others. But there is also a background cyber war, a war of hacks and leaks. In a way, this has been the dog that didn't bark in Ukraine. At the outset of the war, the Economist claimed it would be the first serious cyber war. I think we're still not sure what a cyber war actually is, but if this is it, we haven't learned much about it so far. We have learned, however, that the United States has a lot of information at its disposal, and that it is providing Ukraine with enough to aid its strategy, but without actually assisting it in targeting specific soldiers. This, it seems, is in order to ensure that they don't appear to be a party to the conflict. And so we find the law, language of law at work once again. So that's my zoom out introduction. No solutions there, but I'm sure we'll find some as we go through the group. Yeah, we'll get we'll get to the solutions. Um, hello, everyone online. I see uh, some of my students and colleagues there. And uh, hello, David. We've got the dean of the law school here too. Thank you. Um, so uh, let me just put thirteen questions or so on the table. Uh, my phone never ever rings. <laughs> <laughs> um, so. Uh, the uh, first of all, first question is the question of sanctions, uh, which we may well explore. Uh, uh, how do you even switch these things off? I, 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 you know, uh, I really. <laughs> um, so the first is the question of sanctions, and it, I mean, it strikes me that we're now in a phase of sort of stepping back slightly from the decisions that we've made in the immediate uh, early war phase of what's happening in Ukraine. I mean, there's a lot of enthusiasm. For sanctions, we were sanctioning uh, all sorts of people, you know, football teams, uh, uh, warlords, uh, oligarchs, the Russian people, the ruble, the Russian stock exchange, anything that was remotely Russian. Tchaikovsky was cancelled. You know, you know the story. It was that 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 was the sort of atmosphere, an atmosphere that I think we might come to regret. And sanctions are part of that story. We, we, there's a history of sanctions, in other words, that we have to really think about how successful were they? Uh, how cruel were they in, um, in Iraq and Iran or in Afghanistan? I mean, do they work? Did they work in the interwar period when we applied these vicious uh, reparations on Germany after its um, so-called aggressive war in 1914? Um, 
Because the question of, of second, the question of war crimes and how that language is being deployed at the moment and whether it's a good idea to state that someone's a war criminal before you have tried that individual and what the effects on that individual's behavior might be. So um, as we know, Vladimir Putin, uh, when he was called a, a war criminal, it, it does show the power of the language uh, threatened to cut off diplomatic relations with the United States. Uh, then there's the question of aggression. So we have a little bit, and, and, and you know, some of my international criminal law students are here. We spent a lot of time on uh, aggression and the Kaiser, who I have to mention in every <laughs> speech I give. Uh, uh, so we spent two or three weeks on the crime of aggression, and we really put the crime of aggression into in, in question. And now we've got this strange spectacle of um, two uh, uh, tribunals um, competing over the field of aggression. We've got the ICC, which doesn't really have jurisdiction over aggression, but does have jurisdiction over war crimes and crimes against humanity in Ukraine, in a sort of competition, a sort of marketplace with this new special tribunal uh, that's been um, proposed by Gordon Brown, amongst others, um, for uh, Russia specifically and only. And, and again, the specter of the special tribunal might remind us of certain forms of Stalinism. You know, special tribunals were established for special purposes. And, and there's a, a relationship between the rule of law, which prizes generality, and this idea of ad hocness and specialness and extraordinariness that, that seems to have infected international law thinking. Then there's the question of, you know, spheres of influence. To what extent have the spheres of influence that dominated Cold War thinking and the Cold War sort of migrated into the post-Cold War period? So is it the case that Putin has just reimagined the spheres of influence that people seem very comfortable with during the Cold War? I mean, the Soviet Union, after all, invaded Hungary in 1956 and Czechoslovakia in 1968. We, we didn't intervene then. We condemned it, but, but there was an implicit understanding that that was their space, just as the Soviets implicitly understood that Guatemala, the Dominican Republic, and, and Cuba, to a certain extent, were American spaces where the United States could intervene. Then there's the question of nuclearism. And I really think that the threat of nuclear war uh, sort of appeared briefly at the beginning when uh, Putin made that sort of thinly veiled threat, but has sort of receded again. And yet nuclearism and the, the possibility of a nuclear conflagration over Ukraine really changes the mechanics of this whole conflict. And I've been rather surprised that people haven't spoken more uh, about um, about nuclear war and what it might mean for us, for the planet, for Ukraine, and for the Russians themselves. Um, there's the question of genocide and the way the language of genocide has been used and misused throughout the dispute um, on, on both sides to a certain extent. Uh, certainly the Russians seem to have used uh, a, a spurious accusation of genocide as a pretext for the invasion. Um, but the Ukrainians are now accusing uh, the Russians of committing genocide in Mariupol. And, and I do wonder if the mass bombing of civilian centers, it, it, the, the, the description of the mass bombing of civilian centers as genocide is really doing anyone any good here and um, maybe having an effect on the way we think about the crime of genocide. And I'll just offer three or four more. One is the question of uh, Western hypocrisy. And what, what, you know, what do we do about this? And how do we approach this question? So there, there seem to be two schools of thought. One is that we've, no, we've got no right to accuse the Russians of, of a crime of aggression since we've gone about committing these crimes in places like Iraq um, over the last 50, 100 or 500 years, depending on how you count these things. And then there's another group of people saying it's a disgrace that you use these whataboutery, they call it, whataboutery arguments. Uh, that's, that's got nothing to do with the criminality and venality of the Russian invasion of the Ukraine. So we seem poised between these two rather uncomfortable sets of propositions. Um, then there's the question very closely associated with that of, of, of Western, uh, of NATO's expansion uh, 800 miles eastwards 
after the end of the Cold War. This, the, 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 the reminders we get that when Gorbachev pulled the Red Army out of East Germany, George Shultz said to him, in exchange for this, we won't go east with NATO, not an inch eastward was the phrase used. Um, what's the effect of that sort of promise uh, 30 years ago and the effect of NATO's expansion? It's not a justification, obviously, for this horrible war that the Russians have undertaken in Ukraine, but, but it, again, it slightly changes the calculus in ways that I haven't quite worked out yet. So we need to think about the NATO expansion um, story. And then finally, um, there's the question of history. You know, what do we do about history? How do we deploy it? And what is the relevant comparator? So we seem to be in a kind of 1939 moment, according to the commentariat. We're in an appeasement moment. We mustn't appease Putin because he's like Hitler. And if he's allowed to take Ukraine, rather like Hitler and Czechoslovakia, he'll take the whole lot. So that seems to be one view. Uh, another view that I've tried to put is that this might be a sort of, 19, sort of 1917 moment. We have to decide what to do with a sort of inter-imperial war and whether, whether criminalizing that war is really the right way to approach it or whether that's a rather amateurish, perhaps even childish approach to great power war or um, inter-imperial inter war or whether the relevant moment is, I don't know, Czechoslovakia in 1968, or, or maybe even Cuba in 1962, where John F. Kennedy, after all, threatened to annihilate and wipe Cuba off the earth if, 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 um, if the Russians, if the Soviet Union placed missiles on Cuba. Such was the strong sense that Cuba belonged in the United States sphere of influence, which takes me back to the point I made about spheres of influence and the migration of this idea into the post-Cold War, into the post-Cold War era. Vika. Hi, Terry. I've done something I'm going to repeat, but I'll try and fold it in. Is this Cold War mentality is obviously very pertinent and, and the con concept that this is not though a cold war about ideology, but a cold war about geography. And I was speaking to a colleague yesterday morning who was the special rule of law advisor to NATO, which is a very important person. But she happened to be in Russia um, in 2013, living in Russia, and, and she remembers uh, reorganizations of museums and the fact that Lenin, we'll get back to Lenin, been thinking about Lenin quite a lot recently. They've been, the busts of Lenin have been, were being put in the corner in the broom closets, and the paintings of Catherine the Great, Peter the Great, were all being centralized. And Putin, this, you know, her, her suggestion was, and we're hearing this about information warfare, and this has been a really long project where Putin is, is reinforcing this idea of, of greater Russia and empire. So coming back to Lenin, another thing he said was that there are weeks where decades happen. And there's no doubt uh, that in the last few weeks, a lot has happened and much of it has felt as if it's teetered on the existential. So implicated in this global existential crisis relevant to the four of us and the reason why we are taking your time tonight is really to speak about international law. And certainly international law has been caught up in this existential crisis and also its facilities institution, the United Nations. So I've been reading obituaries in the New York Times uh, for the United Nations, uh, Foreign Affairs, that old rag has published an article um, is that entitled um, the UN is another casualty of Russia's war, why the organisation might never bounce back. We've read these articles before. Um, We've written them. <laughs> <laughs> so this is an exceptional moment, um, but it's far from the only exception of its kind. Um, and I've been reading recently Lawrence Friedman's compelling treatise on the future of war, a history. 
And that includes chapters entitled Decisive Battle, Indecisive Battle, Victory Through Cruelty, Total War, The Balance of Terror, Stuck in the Nuclear Age. And that's only the list of chapters in part one. And that takes us as far as 1962. This is where I'm gonna try and dovetail with Gary's point, that 1962 is a worthy point to pause at this moment in history. Because with all this what about and what, what about is and Iraq keeps being brought up. But it's worth reminding ourselves of 1962 and the Cuban Missile Crisis, a small country bordering on a great power had undergone a revolution eventually leading to the adoption of a conflicting ideologically, uh, ideological, political and economic agenda. And this great power couldn't accept the existence of a communist regime so close to its territory and within the region that it had long considered to be its sphere of interest and influence. Sounds very familiar. So in November 1961, President Kennedy launched Operation Mongoose with a view to overthrowing Castro. And in October 1962, the US would win that Soviet nuclear missiles were being shipped to and placed in Cuba. And so in response, President Kennedy set up a blockade. Um, and in justifying the blockade, the US representative to the UN was quite specific that the crucial fact was that Cuba had given the USSR a bridgehead and staging area in the Western Hemisphere. Now, the General Assembly has recognized that acts of aggression include the blockade of the ports or coasts of a state by the armed forces of another state. This too was an act of aggression. Uh, in response, the Secretary of State at the time, Dean Acheson, dismissed international law. Uh, his argument or justification was that the power position and prestige of the US had been challenged by another state and the law does not deal with such questions of ultimate power. Power that comes close to the sources of sovereignty. The US legal advisor Abraham Chase did raise a legal justification, and he contended that the quarantine action was justified as action by regional organizations to preserve the peace. Now, I can see some of my students here from use of force. We know that regional organizations cannot act to preserve the peace lawfully, cannot use force lawfully, uh, this does not form a legal justification for the use of force. So jumping back to present day, we can assess Putin's explanation of Russia's use of force in Ukraine against this backdrop. Putin hasn't taken Dean Acheson's perspective. He hasn't ignored international law on the basis that law simply does not regulate major political and military crises. Instead, he's used law and legal structures. But like Abram Chase, he's taken those structures and twisted its content to the benefit of Russia's or Putin's underlying political will and interest. Um, Putin's legal justifications for using force are actually more credible than Abram Chase were. Uh, he's used uh, self-defense pursuant to Article 51 protecting Russia from the threat posed by NATO's expansion. He's used the argument of collective self-defense of the supposedly independent uh, Donetsk and Luhansk republics supporting their rights to self-determination. And he's used the argument of humanitarian intervention uh, to stop or prevent the genocide of Russia, Russians in Eastern Ukraine. Now, the problem is the facts, considering the facts underlying these legal justifications, they're bullshit. Not using that in a technical sense. <laughs> Harry Frank's that theory of bullshit. Now here I am drawing on a blog written by Fayed Zabay. Um, and I found it a really interesting way of us engaging with it. Um, he cites Arthur Watts. Uh, those of us who do international law know him as, you know, one of the authors of Oppenheim, a very uh, reputed international lawyer. Uh, was he a legal advisor? I'm telling him might have been a foreign officer, a legal advisor. Luckily, this isn't being recorded and broadcast. <laughs> uh, but what uh, explained uh, that there is room for the view that all that states need for the general purposes of conducting their international relations 
is to be able to advance a legal justification for their conduct, which is not demonstrably rubbish. Now, here, Putin's arguments don't pass the laugh test. Abram Chain's uh, articles don't pass the laugh test. Um, the fact that he's appealed to Lord's authority means that he's actually set the stage for engagement. It, it provides a way into the conversation, unlike Dean Acheson's perspective. You know, we can imagine a situation where instead of debating international law, we'd have to be debating whether or not Ukraine is or is not a country, looking back at the historical justifications, considering the morality uh, of NATO's expansion. Instead, we have a language uh, where we can actually provide a label for these actions and conduct, not as policy choices, but as unlawful. And not just unlawful, and I hear Gary very, I, I quite agree, you know, this, there is a presumption of innocence even in international law, but it's potentially not just unlawful, but criminal. And I think these labels are important. And the labels themselves are not enough. And, and, and again, you'll forgive the fact that you've probably heard a, a few of us talk about this a few times in the last few weeks. I think these conversations are important. My own views are developing day by day. And, and one thing I've shifted from is the idea that, look, it's great. We've got this language. And actually, you know, international law can't stop war, just as domestic law can't stop crime. But actually, I think it's more than the fact that we have a label that law provides a justification for conduct and where it's violated, it provides a justification for coercion. And I think that coercion, potentially there's not just a role for it, but there might be a duty in this case. I'm just gonna conclude in terms of this question of prosecution. Uh, and it's one on which my thoughts are not fully developed. So I'm not going to, to um, waste your time yet with <laughs> <laughs> um, But in 2011, Catherine Sikink, she's a Harvard professor, she wrote a book called The Justice Cascade. And the book talked about how human rights prosecutions are changing world politics. And she offers the argument that highly publicized trials of state leaders in Latin America, Europe and Africa for human rights violations are affecting the behavior of political leaders. That hasn't happened in relation to aggression. They haven't tended to be prosecutions for the crime of aggression since Nuremberg. And so I want us to reflect on the possibility of an injustice cascade. And I want us to think about Crimea, which happened not so long ago. What of it? The reaction was muted. There was certainly no coercion, coercive response. And here we are. No, I think I'll leave it at that. Great, great, excellent, thanks. Uh, Mona. Uh, hi everyone, Mona Paulson. So uh, I originally was excited to be last because I thought it gave me the most time, but I'm actually glad that I'm last because in some ways I'm, I'm speaking to a question of sanctions, mm -hmm. but I am also parting a little bit from my colleagues because to me this moment coming at it from a perspective of focusing on international economic law, is one that I actually see this not as replicated in the past of actions, but actually see this as quite new. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna talk a little bit about what is going on with the economic sanctions, particularly in the trade context, and then reflect on what this means for that particular institution, the International Trade Institution, World Trade Organization. So what we see over the past few years, this is actually, beginning around the same time of the annexation of Korea, but starting around 2016, as we see governments slowly beginning to seek to widen their policy space. And that meant a lot of invocation to exception to trade rules, to the normal trading rules and what that meant for the growth then of economic globalization. It meant that pursuant to those rules, governments could act outside of multilateral legal channels altogether in times of war or in times of emergency in their national relations. So for example, governments could invoke a central security interest to impose sanctions on Russian imports, as we see through bans or increased tariffs. What we have seen just in a matter of the past three weeks is 
on an unprecedented scope and depth of these sanctions, financial and economic trade. Much of this began initially with Ukraine severing all, all ties with the Russian Federation. And then out of the following states, Canada was actually the first to take trade action. This is following all the financial sanctions that were imposed, trade action to seek to begin what we've slowly now seen over the course of several weeks of unilaterally yet somehow coordinated actions within the World Trade Organization to uh, withdraw tariff entitlements, which essentially raise the costs of imports and exports, bans we've seen in the United States set prohibitions on imports of energy products, as well as other products, prohibitions on investment in Russia, restricted export, exports of luxury goods, uh, ex extreme targeting of Russian oligarchs. We've seen Japan, Australia join in Canada to impose sanctions this on Russian individuals. Interestingly, just last week, March 15th, the US, the EU and its member states, UK, Japan, South Korea, Australia, Canada, Norway, New Zealand, Albania, Albania, Iceland, Moldova, Montenegro, and North Macedonia issued a joint statement. Now, why am I listing all of them? Because out of a membership of 164 countries, those 14 issued a joint statement. Now, I should say joint sanctions are not allowed within the WTO rule architecture. So they are acting unilaterally, but they wrote to the WTO General Council, sort of head organization that the membership works through to do the day-to-day -day functions of this institution, condemning Russia's aggression towards Ukraine and threatening to suspend further of the concessions and other obligations that they have towards Russia, including a, a provision that'll, that requires them to treat Russia and Russian goods and services in the same way as all the other memberships, goods and services. They argued within the context of a trade institution that they were taking that action due to Russia's, and I'm quoting here, an egregious violation of international law, UN Charter, the fundamental principles of international peace and security. They invoked the language of those security exceptions saying that they were taking that, their actions were justified to protect those central security interests. I want to be clear that this was extraordinary. Most of the time, these governments are not bringing into the WTO House questions of foreign affairs politics. This is seen as to be left outside the door such that they can focus on trade and investment within the context, focusing on development. So even though these institutions were in the post-war context designed to help governments facilitate interdependence, help them achieve and seek their goals of peace, when it came to questions of war or international peace and security, that was left at the door. Now, of course, as my colleagues have mentioned, there were many instances where there were conflicts, where there were sanctions imposed. And in fact, this happened throughout, you know, thinking about the Falkland War, thinking about Cuba, thinking about conflicts with Nicaragua, the United States severed relations with Czechoslovakia. So there are points throughout time where this happened, but never to the scale that we have seen. How has Russia responded? So, Right after this joint action, Russia responded to WTO members about these trade sanctions. And the framing was extremely important. Russia positioned this as an economic war launched by other members. And consequently, they were in direct violation of WTO rules. There is no mention in the formal letter of Russia's responsibilities. Russia lays out the trade sanctions other members have opposed, but they don't address how those members jointly invoked essential security in light of Russia's invasion of Ukraine. So whereas Davika was talking about the defense from Russia, here we see Russia's commenting on other countries' affirmative defense. Russia challenged the proposals by the Ukraine and the other members that joined of these proposals to either expel or suspend Russian participation within the WTO. There's no formal rule that would enable this to occur. It's possible the members then if they cannot uh, through consensus and Russia would not agree, therefore they would not have consensus to have this action occur. They would have to change the WTO constitution. The only other way they could do that is the members vote. Now, again, 
14 members, and now there are a few more, have placed sanctions on Russia in the context of the trade world. The other members have not. So it's unclear whether they would have the voting. But let me say above all that no voting has ever taken place in WTO. It sets a dangerous precedent. And even though there have been other conflicts in the past, that voting has not occurred. So you can never say never, but it would be extremely unprecedented. So what does this mean for economic globalization? We've seen economists, Adam Posen, the head of the Peterson Institute, by the way, I have to acknowledge that the Peterson Institute is the one that's actually charting every single economic and financial sanction. So if you're interested, uh, see Chad Bounds' work on that because it's extraordinary. It's very thorough. So the broader question that for, for me here is what is the future of trade multilateralism? Because it directly impacts what we know as economic globalization. So to quote from REM, is this the end of the world as we know it? I'm not feeling fine for those that know that. So, okay. Russia raises the problem with claiming to isolate Russia. It will inevitably block the negotiation process, Russia has formally stated this. So of course, this is not just political. Russia invaded Ukraine. But it's an open question as to how the governments can continue to work. We've, we've heard, my colleagues and I have been talking and listening to the fact that in every meeting that's going on at the WTO, members are raising the question of Russia. They were supposed to have this formal conference that they do every two years this summer, where they were supposed to address many issues that are important to many governments. But right now, it doesn't look like they're going to be able to have that conference. And because of the pandemic, they have not met for a number of years. This causes a huge problem for governments to be able to continue that important function of the World Trade Organization to continue to coordinate and talk. So we know that in times of war, according to the trade institution, no legal rule will stop a state from acting to protect its essential security interests. The idea here is that trade multilateralism then this multilateral, all the governments working together will not bend in time of war, or sorry, it will bend, it will not break. That's the hope. But nor should it stay silent, as I would argue. So some say that the fact that the governments are evoking essential security interests to sort of take it out of the context to be able to impose these sanctions that are actually inconsistent with WTO rules, but in the name of essential security interests, is evidence that in fact the system is working because there is a rule, there is an exception, and that permits them to do so. But what happens when the function, what happens to the function of the legal rules in that moment? Particularly when economic globalization, when that interdependence, those global supply chains, the building of smartphones, the building of airplanes still needs to continue to work. And if there are no rules for what happens in that in-between, in that moment where you are invoking an exception and the laws are paused, then what happens? What happens to the planning or the recuperation? All of the impacted countries. Remember, this is not just, as we know, a, a, a strictly territorial issue, even though that would be the framing that Russia has portrayed this as. Many, many countries are impacted by this. There's records of impacting from energy prices and food prices, fertilizer. Russia provides a significant number of commodities that affect everything that we all use around the world. And particularly in a time of pandemic, many economists have raised concerns about what this would do for certain countries. So to come back to that idea about the WTO as enabling governments to coordinate, be transparent about their trade policies, there's no requirement for this in security context, in times of war. That obligation for transparency is suspended. So if we put a pin in the moral and political justifications for isolating Russia through trade actions, through the trade institution that it necessarily participates in, we should then consider some of the recommendations on the history of sanctions, like Nicholas Mulder, who's at Cornell, he focuses on the history of trade sanctions, and he has written a couple of pieces, I think one of them in Foreign Affairs, talking about 
putting attention to the people, to the everyday, those that are impacted by energy capacity and energy prices, rising prices. So I, I think for those issues, then we have to think about what do we do in the absence of the rules? So my argument today and my observation, I hope that my colleagues will talk to me about, is that one of the solutions or thinking through the impacts of the Russian war or even the global crisis of pandemic climate change, which are so actually interrelated to what is happening, is to how we break apart from that ideal of multilateralism, this idea that governments were meant to come together and all operating consensus. Because it's clear that as far as the relationship between security and trade have gone, there are no longer strange bedfellows. So if governments don't coordinate, we risk seeing incredible fractures. And I think this is where now we come back to you know, the repeated concerns about, is this the end of our international organizations? Because I hear the same thing about the World Trade Organization. This is the end of the World Trade Organization. This is the end of governments working together. We're going to see fractures, which will lead to groupings of governments. Mm -hmm. Yeah, oh, you're warning me. Okay. I am warning you. <laughs> That's fine. Um, I mean, I think what we have here is a, is a concern between increased interdependence and governments at the same time failing to appreciate the impacts of their sanctions, being able to understand when those sanctions will unroll, being able to understand the full impact of the sanctions because they are so unprecedented, because it's never been done with the, in the state of increased economic globalization, and that is how it perhaps is distinct from other times, not just a major nuclear power, but also one that is deeply embedded within complex global supply chains. That is unprecedented. Without any coordination or discussion, remember again, due to security, that is all suspended. Governments, but particularly the people living in all countries around the world are forever going to be three steps behind. So what can we do? We need to think about how we operate in the absence of these formal legal mechanisms. So governments have to then begin to think of it. If they're not going to agree to strong legal binding rules because they're operating in times of security, that in at least informal mechanisms, this comes up to the soft law options. How can we think past a perfect sense of multilateralism and embrace the rules that could come in between, not just thinking about the roles of persuasion or coercion on governments, but how to find something in the middle where they can redefine transparency or interdependence even in time support. I'll stop there. Great, thank you, thank you. Um, are you okay down there, Manuela? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank okay, you. great. Um, so well, well, we've got lots of time for questions, comments um, from from the floor. Felix, you're already- Yeah, I, I have one immediately on there now. Okay. I guess I wanted to- uh, So to we're gonna collect some questions. <laughs> uh, we're gonna collect some questions. Did so, you raise, raise the question of whether this is the end of international institutions? I wanted to ask whether you think it may be the end of institutions created in a certain spirit of the 90s of like this neoliberal world. I guess we have seen fractures in the WTO before, with mostly I would say with the government body not being in place at the moment, and the Biden administration even being unwilling to again name, um, name Canada. And I wonder whether with like also possibly upcoming, I think at the moment a bit keen down Chinese, Yes, rivalry probably being the death nail in the WTO as a you know, Whether we will, what's your thought on that? You're okay, okay. Go for answer. Yes, why not? Um, so it is unprecedented in the sense that the absence of the appellate body you saw that even though the United States had concerns with the appellate body, they were finding workarounds. Governments were willing to still participate. The panel process was still operating. Of course, the tensions had been rising between the United States and China were escalating, and that showed the inability to be able to accommodate different developmental approaches, right? Different approaches to development. That is one about how to reform the rules and itself is extremely challenging. I find that this, the operation in times of security is quite different. And in fact, what I would draw to is the fact that the United States had already been very keen to use the idea of security to be able to act unilaterally because it felt like it didn't need to, or there were good reasons to operate outside. 
But at least then there was some commitment to still act together to be transparent. This would simply be a, a halting of all the groups and that to me is concerning. But of course, we all still need everything from one another. We are still heavily interdependent. That hasn't changed. So if we see an end to economic globalization, we have to take seriously what would, what would happen. What would happen would be what we've seen, this emphasis on resilience or strategic autonomy or uh, self-sufficiency that we've seen sort of the governments begin to use to bring everything back home. Um, Adam Posen, who's a, an economist, has said, but to do so, then we sacrifice efficiencies, we sacrifice choice, we sac you know, there's consequences of price. So it would be a question of whether governments are willing to do that exchange for being able to have that ability to act alone. They'll be seeing a decrease, not necessarily to the 90s, but to before the invention of these trade institutions. Now we're really coming back to the period in the first half of the 20th century. Not really yeah, one one really big um, framing device. I'm so hypnotized by this uh, typing as ever. You know, like, how are they translating me this time? One uh, one big framing device here is the question about whether this is new or not, uh, and this comes up every time there's a major crisis. I mean, Davika touched on this. Um, every time there's a major war, somebody stands up in foreign affairs and says the UN's over or international laws over. Or when I arrived at the LSE, I think the first sort of six public lectures I saw were called the end of sovereignty. <laughs> uh, so this, this war is really about the, the rebirth of sovereignty, if you like, and perhaps every war is. You know, We keep thinking it's over and then it revives itself. Uh, Iraqi sovereignty, Libyan sovereignty, Ukrainian sovereignty. I mean, if we have, if we're talking about anything here, we seem to be talking about the idea that a state or the people in that state should organize their own affairs, you know, a classic sovereign idea. And if we think of sovereignty as somehow being juxtaposed to globalization, then that becomes even more interesting. There's a sort of revival or rebirth of sovereignty around here. But Philip Jessup, um, an international lawyer, once said something along the lines, you know, beware uh, people bearing the gifts of novelty. And I think that's been the case in almost every major crisis I've encountered while teaching at the LSE. Okay, um, other questions from the floor and yeah. I have also a question from the audience. I didn't quite understand the, sorry, <laughs> the security um, aspect. So in the WTO framework, can you use um, the so security to also to, if the security, so if the war does not impact the country directly, you still use security as an excuse to kind of deviate from the rules? Because I thought that maybe in a trade context, security would mean something that concerns your economy internally. Um, so this takes us back to questions from Gary about nuclearism. Because, uh, so it has been done. We saw uh, Falkland War as an example, where we saw Canada and Australia uh, and the European communities join to bring sanctions. And Argentina made that claim, actually, that this is just a regional dispute. You know, other, other members shouldn't be involved. I think when, at the time when the governments first began to act, the characterization of why they were acting was, I think, in the context of this concern. Putin had just raised this concern of nuclear war. Many countries, I think, at that point, instantly found the great need to have this be an escalation. I think the other framing now is one of simply the fact that governments, the producers, the consumers, everyone is so deeply interconnected um, that because of this, you know, two, two political scientists, Henry Farrell and Abe Newman, have talked about the weaponization of interdependence that we're seeing here. And due to those concerns of how this is being used, when one government begins to act this way, even if it's a territorial issue initially, it's no longer one because the, the sheer interdependence of this has made it a security concern for all. And that's, I think, the logic for everyone. Can I just add a bit to that? I just want, because it is quite interesting that sanctions themselves, if we try and fit them into a legal framework, and I'm going beyond the WTO measures here, um, they're actually a form of countermeasures. Yeah. And you're only allowed to take countermeasures if you're an injured state. So I just, um, this might not be interesting to you, but I, I think it goes to the same point. Yeah, and so it's actually quite controversial under international law, whether 
any state apart from Ukraine at the moment is an injured state. Um, and it is sort of asking us to test the boundaries of Adirondas, for example. Um, and yet the extent to which we are all injured. And, and I think that even if I might bring this back to international criminal law, yeah. <laughs> goes as far as asking us to question who is injured, which community is injured at the moment? Is this a crime against the international community? And I'm going to get really controversial here. So, <laughs> ready? It's not the recording. <laughs> Close the doors. Yeah. Um, there was a, an event at UCL and Colleagues got in a bit of trouble as between themselves. There was a debate uh, about whether you know, there's selectivity and, and why do we care more about Europeans? And then there was a big fight and you know, <laughs> someone ended up saying something like, well, of course, Europeans care more about Europeans, et cetera. We know the terrain we're in. But can I just say, this is Europe's problem. And so when I'm thinking about who should prosecute, for example, I actually can see a real argument that Europe should create this court, that this is a European problem. And that there's nothing selective about, you know, Europe setting up a court for a crime committed within Europe. Now, I've gone well beyond your question, um, but it, it, it comes back to this question as to how are we defining the, the injury here? Um, is this a crime against the international community and so therefore something that should be addressed at an international level by the General Assembly only. Uh, you know, how do we work this out uh, in terms of constituency? Can I just say one thing also, very, I'm so sorry. Um, you know, it, it bears in mind to know too, this really speaks to what Davika was just saying, that for some of the countries like Canada, it's almost political because the trade on what those goods were revolved with was so small. So the big trading partners to support to what Davika was saying is the European Union members. They're the ones that are greatly trading on certain of these goods, right? Especially energy, oil and gas, um, as is China, but it's not imposed sanctions. So there's, you know, it, it really matters. This is a strong political uh, decision as well as an economic. I mean, these, these, I'm just going to bring David in in a minute, but these, these invocations of, of humanity and uh, international community worry me. Uh, I see all glass of heard over and over again, but uh, um, this is a kind of Carl Schmidt point, isn't it? About, he, you know, he who invokes humanity cheats, you know, so who is humanity? We always seem to be on the side of humanity whenever we invoke it. But there's, a, there's another phrase of Otto Kirschheimer's that's been sort of going through my head since this all began, where he said, every, every regime needs its foes or in due course creates them. And I, I do wonder if somehow there's a memory of the Cold War circulating here and that we, we lost our foe, the Soviet Union, and we spent 30 years in a desperate search for new foes. We found various foes, Serbia, Afghanistan, Al-Qaeda, and we pushed further and further eastwards, and eventually we found the foe, and it was the same old foe again, but in new clothes. It was Russia, the, the latest enemy of mankind, the latest pirate. David. Yeah, that's right. Um, I mean, <laughs> Is that all you wanted to yeah. say? <laughs> We know, what, we know what the next James Bond's going to look like, right? <laughs> so we all came here, guys, for solutions, right? And um, I'm not sure I've heard any. Um, so, so, and maybe I have heard them, and I think about it a little bit more deeply. So it seems like there might be two solutions and, and split on the panel. So I wanted to push you on, on it a little bit more. So on the one side, there is an idea that the solution is found in the rejection of international legal language. The international legal language squashes complexity. And when we squash complexity, it's much more difficult to find a solution to something so complex as this. And then the other side of the fence, which is split down the panel in the middle, I think actually, we have the idea that no law matters. There is real legality here, real illegality, and there is bullshit 
And when we identify real illegality, we then find duty. And with duty comes action, and with action, the solution is boots on the ground in the Ukraine. Um, NATO boots on the ground. So I, I, I just wanted to push you on that. Is, is that right? Is that a fair characterization of where the panel splits on this? This is something that we'll all have our perspective on. Mine is that the solution is not boots on the ground and certainly international law doesn't require use of force to be the solution. So I just certainly would like to clarify that that's not but the, the, the solution is a political question, not a legal one. Law can provide, I suppose, um, some mechanisms and techniques. But that is a political question in the end, which of those is opted for. I, I am, I'm aware, though, actually, I, I, I do want to explore the idea that there is some obligation under law um, to, to take some form of action, but I do want to clarify that I definitely didn't mean the solution has to be paused. I, I think you're putting me in the category, David, of a person who thinks that the legal language is squashing other languages. And I think that is in fact where I belong. Um, <laughs> I, I think that's, that's the case. Uh, um, and I think about the Iraq war as an example of that. We spent a lot of time um, talking about the legality of the Iraq war. It seemed like a very important discussion to have. We all became very excited about that as international lawyers, but I do wonder if we shouldn't have been talking about how we propose to reconstruct Iraqi civil society after the war during that period, instead of talking about Security Council resolutions. So there was a, there's an example or a possible example of a moment where uh, law generated some pretty significant losses. And I think at the moment we're in that phase again. I think, I think international legal language, not, not the language that the Vika speaks so nicely and well, but the language that's been deployed by the political class is, is, a, a, is a sort of dangerous uh, language for us at the moment. It's sort of language that forces us to declare that Vladimir Putin is a war criminal. It's hard then to come back from that and say, actually, maybe we need to negotiate with this first in order to end this ghastly war. So I do worry that international law does a great deal of damage at certain moments and also opens up certain possibilities. So one of the solutions that I have been sort of exploring is the idea of neutrality. And we can think of neutrality as an international legal technique or gesture. So it's not all downside. Uh, yeah, I, I, I guess you're putting me in that camp as well. I, I wouldn't put you in any camp, I was just identifying um, a divide. So, so what's striking to me uh, to some extent is uh, for the past 30 years, um, the West has been jumping into various conflicts for various reasons or various justifications that don't sound very plausible to me to international laws. And now um, we, in fact, have a very strong case of international law for boots on the ground, actually, uh, for collective security. And it's hardly being spoken about at all. Instead, we're hearing a lot of stuff about uh, a, a, a special course to try aggression and war crimes course that may or may not, that, that seem very unlikely to come into being. And so you do find yourself wondering, well, what work is international law doing here? It seems to spend a lot of time creating conversations that are a little bit beside the point. Um, I don't think it's as simple as, you know, international law is our tool to some extent. So the way we engage it activates the sorts of politics we want to see happen. Um, so at some level, I feel like um, um, it, it, it's, it's not for or against. It's how does one engage and what does one put to it? Got a question here, but the VP, you want to I'm so that? sorry, just uh, I was yeah. going to say three. Oh, sorry, yeah, yeah, yeah. But Gary poached me with saying, um, Iraq, we should have stayed and, and potentially reconstructed. And I, I just want to either misinterpret what you were saying, but use it anyway to, to come back to David. Yeah. And Iraq, 
it was then the self-defence justification turned into a duty to impose democracy or a right to democracy, which does not exist under international law. to impose democracy under international law with some pretense at some justification under international law. And actually that was incredibly, I think, damaging um, the idea that it, it, it should, that international law has that. And, and again, this comes back to this idea of, well, under whose banner then do we do things like that? If we're going to impose a regime on another nation, one or a few states have no justification right duty under international law to do that uh, that if anything you know the security council could do it uh, but certainly they didn't in that case I'm just going to i am going to bring you that policy <laughs> but i have to speak directly to that point because it goes to david's question too i think that the, 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 the difference between you and i at the moment in this conversation is uh, that you think the danger lies from what you you are, are rightly describing as misuses of international law. They took self-defense and they turned it into some justification for a democratic state joining and invading other countries, that kind of thing, which we could pull apart doctrinally. I think my point is that just ordinary use of them. So that, that, that would be the sort of difference, that even legal arguments uh, have dangerous side effects. It's not just the misuses of international law, it's the use of it that's, that's, that's the problem. Mona. Um, yeah. I. I want to say that my, I, I mean, and this is sort of a, a qualification or clarification as well. I'm not, I'm not trying to argue that because of the economic globalization, we need to not be taking these actions. Of course, governments make those choices. And I agree with Dabika that in an that extent, it's a political question. What I do see concerning is the fact that with this imposition of, of economic sanctions and financial sanctions, that there is no complementary discussion about when or how long or the extent. A lot of it is in the realm of politics. And there, I hope that governments will use law not to impose decisions or to requirement, but it, in, in the way of, the, of, the, of, the, of the, uh, the ability to create a mechanism to communicate and coordinate, to build those discussions. There, I see it as very important not only because there are people's lives that are being impacted both in Russia and in Ukraine and more broadly for the rest of the world, but also because it sets, it sets down the line, we're seeing awareness already of, and this comes back to your question earlier, um, about the precedence that it's setting for things that were already happening at the same time. So I share with Stephen a concern for climate change and the impacts of this happening. And we see it in real time. And if governments are more inclined to connect climate with insecurity or exceptionalism, that we're moving further away from those legal structures that would enable governments to actually coordinate, which I think is an important part of thinking about concerns that impact everyone, whether we think of a community or not. I think these are coming down the line. So, so let's treat this as a bit of a sort of town in the hall moment then, where we sort of hear from you and 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 we'll start we'll start with your your question or comment. Um, and then bring in others. So you kind of answered the question out like, so I was just volunteering in Hungary last week, um, just with the Ukrainian refugees, and it's, I feel like it's being there, it's more devastating than it seems like the news, like actually having mothers bringing six to 10 babies through the border is actually in real life, um, kind of overrides all this legal language, and I don't have legal background, so maybe that's, but if that question really answered one of part of my question, but the, the question then stands, um, up to which point can this happen where something that bad to humanity, to Ukraine, to life happens that international law, humanitarian law, or something needs to step in? Like, where is the line legally, or is there a line where if that's crossed, by, by Russia or by this whole situation, then then it is truly then justified to do something. I think that's my question. Mm -hmm. Great. Uh, we'll, 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 yeah, and yeah. we do something, do you mean for all, all 
Do you name forms? Yeah. Uh, not just or just like um yeah i guess yeah right. or any type of Sorry. reaction yeah like any type of like stronger reaction that in that is other questions yes yeah so uh, i was kind of thinking about the, so the first intervention um there was a comment about how when we talk about this from a use in bellow perspective it almost seems like we're saying this is okay this is this causes a you know this problem. and i i have this feeling as well i shared this feeling but i kind of don't understand why i have this feeling because if i imagine myself in an exam situation and there's a question general public international law um and i hope this will not be the case <laughs> Assess the this of Russians of Russia's action in Ukraine. I would have a section on the use of vellum, and I would probably say it's unlawful. And then I would have a section on, let's say, one specific act on the use in the use in vellum, and I would say, okay, maybe maybe actually this was lawful. And uh, overall, my result would still be this is unlawful. Um, so in this setting, I would not feel discomfort, but then you kind of do, and I wonder. So there's been a lot. <laughs> Using this frame a lot um, of international law as a language. It always seems like it is one monolithic one thing. But I'm wondering whether it maybe it is not, it is more of a use of implications of different languages therein. And sometimes we have false ranks where, for instance, one word like necessity um, means one thing in a certain language to use Abdel and causes a certain feeling in this language. But another one in another language, Sindalo. And I was just wondering, do you think that is this like feeling of discomfort, this kind of clash? Is that inevitable? Is there any way we can deal with this? Can we still use the language of Sindalo to talk about the horrendous things that are happening and condemn them while not causing this uncomfortable kind of tension with the other languages that we also need to use up to them? Say this question involves. Good question on the exam. <laughs> <laughs> but, but before you answer it, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, so I would like to uh, I would like to ask the panel to expand upon uh, one point that uh, was uh, only very briefly mentioned among the 13 questions that Professor Simpson has suggested uh, about NATO expansion. So um, if I understand if I understood that correctly, you said that of course. NATO expansion in itself is not a justification for what Russia is doing, and Russia tries to justify their actions by um, the supposed threat that mm -hmm. the NATO expansion has posed to it. Um, but it puts things in a, a particular perspective, right? So I'd like to ask you to expand upon this point a little bit, because as I said, I, and, and I was just you know asking uh, this question for myself. Okay, so we. It's supposedly we hadn't expanded NATO to countries like Poland in 1999. Would Poland not be in Ukraine's place today? So Ukraine would have stayed in the Russia's influence zone, so to speak, uh, very firmly. Uh, and would, um, for instance, Poland uh, would try to uh, join structures like uh, NATO. Would Russia not then say that Poland's willingness to join NATO is a threat to Russia's and their uh, friends' uh, national security? And when, the, when do we draw this line? Because out of countries that uh, hadn't joined NATO then, we see Belarus, uh, which is a puppet state of Russia. We see Ukraine, which is invaded by Russia. We see Moldova, which has part of its territory controlled by a pro-Russian force, or uh, Georgia, which was also invaded by Russia in uh, 2008. And wh where is this line? So for instance, if Poland hadn't joined NATO, uh, if it uh, was taken into the Russia's influence zone, what then? Would Russia have pretenses to German reunification? Would it dispose uh, a threat to the Russian, the Russia's national security then? So is this Russian expansionism even satisfiable in a sense? Uh, I, I don't know myself, I'm just asking you. Sorry. I have a question. Um, I have a question about sanctions as well, um, but it's... it's, it's um, it has more focus on kind of the political, um, social elements of it. Um, I'm wondering what you think about the framing of sanctions as collective punishment, and whether you think it's um, like too soon to be thinking about the potential human rights implications that the sanctions can have. Because um, if you look at sanctions in other countries, for example, in Iran, 
um, said quite devastating impact on access to medical care and whether you think it's even possible to think of that at this point in, in the crisis um, or whether that's more of a long-term concern. Um, and I guess how that goes into thinking about the effectiveness of sanctions in ending the war, if that's what they're trying to do with that. Let's start uh, yeah, sure. Um, that's a wonderful question, Susanna. I'm just going to, uh, uh, I, and um, I guess the bit of it I want to focus in on is you question this notion of international law here as a kind of a monolithic figure, which you must interpret in some way uh, as a, uh, an agent in history. To me. And what struck me, coming back in the way to David's question, is that actually, of course, the split isn't so much maybe between and gender has been a long panel here, um, but rather between those of us dealing with uh, war and criminal law on the one hand, and I think motive to some extent, dealing with economic, international economic law on the other, because the meticulousness with which the structures of economic law are followed and attended to contrast rather sharply with what we see happening all the time when it comes to the law of war and international criminal law. They simply seem to be serving very different functions in the way we think about our world and what we think is important and where we need to keep our promises and you know, debts must be paid, or we can cross some of these into some of these territory of the job we'll have. There's a there's a sort of a vast distinction there. And so if you want to be effective, if you want solutions, when you be sanctioned, because actually that's where you're going to be able to mobilize and, and, and really bite and really hurt. And one of the fascinating things about what's happening now, I think, is the is the power of the banks. Right, in, in actually making things first in Russia, the power of social media. There's all these ways in which uh, uh, Russia, Russians, ordinary Russians are being required to sort of look in the mirror, take account of that in a way that couldn't have happened then. Um, and, and that's extraordinary. Uh, and that's also a function of law. I mean, it's, not, it's not law as we talk about it all the time, there's a lot of things that talk about it. So I think it's difficult to know the full extent right now as things are happening. Do I think that they should not consider the human element of sanctions? I think they should have thought about it before they even impose it, right? This is something that they immediately need to think about. And the question is, you know, are, are governments explaining that? I mean, do I, think that, do I think that sanctions are there to stop Russia? I'm not sure if that's... That's what we know. And we, we know from history that, you know, again, drawing from Nicholas Mulder, his work on this, one of his main arguments of the book is that actually they didn't create that, that they didn't stop war from happening. They were themselves an act of financial war, war for them, right? Um, and I think this is why the sort of the need to think about them and to actually ask governments to think about, okay, for how long, when would it stop? How much further can we go? I mean, you know, Stephen's right that the immense freezing of assets, even the central bank, all the reserves now going after the oligarchs, now going after individuals that really stop treating to stop Russia and its tracks. And, and it's, you know, and this is the question of how, how long can that go? And now trade is the other side, right? Because trade is what gives them further income back in. And they've already stopped what they had saved because Russia had had a considerable amount of assets saved in various places. And they've just, they've cut all ties to that. So it's really about getting them to be at the most vulnerable position. That in tandem works with the military, uh, the sort of armed conflict that comes along with this. But at this point, there's not clear when it's going to, to end, which is you know, a, a legitimate question. There should be these processes. And that's why I sort of want to see governments begin to talk about that, to think about how it's impacting people. Because it absolutely is, right? You have to think about human contact that's happening. So. No, I, I want, actually I've been told to take some questions from the, from the <laughs> screen. Somebody just came on, so when, when are we gonna be able to have yeah, our questions answered? Questions. So there are five questions on the screen, but I can't actually see them. So maybe if we take Malti's question while this is happening. Yeah, brilliant. So we'll sort of get on top of these questions <laughs> while you ask your question. Thank you. Um, I was wondering about uh, yeah, the, the employment of, of, of genocide, as you alluded to in the questions as well. And I, I think there's a whole range of interesting questions about that, but particularly um, the reliance of the ICJ uh, provisional measures on 
the genocide convention, interesting enough, really not, like, not really about, it doesn't seem to really be about genocide. So I'm wondering what, what the panel thinks of the, the way the ICGJ create, made provisional measures <coughs> to stop the war based on the genocide convention. Because it seems like being in a teleological way, it seems such a, it seems to make sense because it's so much in the spirit of the fundamental norm and so I'm wondering what, what, what do you think? It doesn't make sense to me, though it seems a little twisted to, to reach to this result through the genocide. Is there a valid way to pursue this, or, or do you think it's, it's rather harmful? Well, should I, how should we deal with these questions? I mean, they're up on the, they're up there. Russia's a global power, current member of the SC. What would have to happen bring the Putin administration to justice? Okay, well, that's a question. Uh, question to Dubik and Gary, do you believe something? Do you believe the temporary exclusion of Russia from the UNSC is both feasible and desirable? And then question, I think Gary mentioned earlier the idea of a special tribunal for Russia. Does this sort of proposition not seem dangerous? Finally, I feel that we're slightly disadvantaged here online. Nobody reads us. Well, we are. We are. <laughs> <laughs> we are reading you now, reading you loud and clear. So let's let's have a go at some of those questions. Um, thoughts on those? Well, sure, and I'll hand over it to you. Um, so, Lena, um, uh, no, and Vanessa, I think, both raised the Security Council and Russia's position on the Security Council, and Lena quite sensibly was like, seriously, what is the chances of Putin being prosecuted. I'm sorry, Lena, I can't see your question now. I hope, I think that's essentially what you were saying. It's a global power. Um, I, again, I have not yet concluded what I think about that because I think it's highly unrealistic that he's going to be prosecuted anytime soon. Um, but I don't know. I still think that there is merit in setting up a tribunal, in collecting, you know, the evidence and getting the structures in place, potentially in an in absentia prosecution, declaring that he is a war criminal. <laughs> and I think if his job description on Wikipedia in the future is not former president of the Russian Federation, but guilty of the crime of aggression, I think, I think that that is still potentially worthwhile. Um, the question, Vanessa, uh, about do you believe the temporary exclusion of Russia or its voting rights from the Security Council is both useful and desirable? Again, potentially, my view is controversial. I think Russia must stay on the Security Council. I think Russia must maintain its voting rights on the Security Council. I think that the Security Council is there to maintain a balance of power in uh, the international legal order. I think the UN is there not to prevent war, to, but to prevent world war in the end. And that's not to say that I think the balance of power should now shift to the General Assembly. And so because the Security Council is paralyzed, it means we can't have this efficient body. We have to now go to the broader body and, and work with the General Assembly uh, in that respect. Yeah, yeah. Um, we are going to finish at half past eight, by the way, just, just to clarify. Um, yeah, so I, I keep getting asked this question uh, about whether uh, Putin will be prosecuted. This, this, as a matter of sort of ethnography, is a question that the media is very interested in because whenever I get a call from, it was the World Service yesterday, and they, they asked me about War crimes trials, you know, I mentioned Carl Schmidt, they're not interested in that. Uh, they're not interested in really anything I have to say. And then they, they asked me the question again, well, will Putin be, never mind Carl Schmidt and Otto Kirchheimer, <laughs> will Putin be on trial anytime soon? So I sort of adopt a slightly different hat. I become a different international lawyer in that moment. And I take the question seriously, and I'm going to take the question seriously now. And the answer is that you just never can quite tell. This is a, this is a law of unintended consequences, uh, international criminal law. So really, I think in 1943 at Moscow, was there a serious prospect of the 
major Nazi war criminals standing trial. Um, hard to say. It was a kind of gesture that was made by the Allied powers. They hadn't won the war yet, and they were sort of planning a trial. Would it ever happen? Would Hermann Goering really end up on trial? Adolf Eichmann was living his life happily in, in Buenos Aires as a, a working in a photo shop, going to work each day, having participated in the final solution as the head of the Gestapo unit responsible for the final solution. He was he, he pleaded superior orders. The only order he refused to obey was the order to stop killing Jewish people in Europe. Um, it looked as if he would die in Buenos Aires, but he was in fact abducted by Israeli agents, taken back to Jerusalem, and he stood trial and was executed. President Milosevic, it seemed impossible that he would end up on trial anywhere. Pinochet, well, he came to London uh, to have tea with Margaret Thatcher and to <laughs> seek medical treatment and ended up being subject to extradition proceedings at the House of Lords, now, all of those were unexpected. So it's impossible to say that Putin certainly will not stand trial. If, if, so that's one sort of answer to, to that, particular, that particular question. Um, excluding Russia from the Security Council, I think exclusion is the wrong way to go here. I think the relentless and self-righteous punishment of the Russian people and the Russian state is likely to have somewhat contradictory effects on international peace in the end. Uh, well, um, Malta's question, uh, the ICJ intervening in this genocide uh, ruling and speaking instead of about the regional measures with regard to the use of force, worryingly perhaps a pyrrhic victory, I suppose. I mean, so I've got mixed feelings about this, I guess, much in the same way as, as one might about a potential uh, a, a trial of Putin at some point. You welcome, it sounds wonderful. It, it, it does what you want an international court to do when you celebrate. And then you step back a little bit and you notice, well, actually, nothing has changed here. Has it? And you worry a little bit then, well, perhaps to be an international court and stand your ground in something as important as this and be shown to not have any real effect isn't such a good thing, perhaps. There's something to be said for stepping back a little bit and being a bit more circumspect and understanding why that's how we characterize a court like the ICJ. So I, I, it, it's a complicated question. I, I don't think it's a, and in a way, time will tell. But uh, I, I'd love to be able to embrace it in a way that I don't quite feel is, is appropriate. Uh, NATO expansion, I just want to pick it very slightly. I think you very nicely picked out of what Gary mm -hmm. said a nice inversion that he'd introduced there because we are all busy with Russian expansion. And uh, it, it, it's perhaps good to remember that this does begin with a form of NATO expansion. In a way, the answer to your question probably lies somewhere between Finland and Estonia. But I can't help fearing that um, Ukraine used to be Habsburg Ukraine and Russian Ukraine. I have a line right down the middle. And it was, as somebody pointed out to us uh, uh, last time around, the border. That's, that's what it means, the border. Um, to some extent, Ukraine, I feel, has been treated incredibly poorly over the last 10 years by the EU and NATO in particular. And when Biden steps forward, and you remind us very nicely here uh, of the original implication of that inch of territory and says in response to the invasion of Ukraine, we will defend every inch of NATO territory. There's something horribly cynical in there. There's something very easy about the way NATO seems to be riding high on it. It's really enjoying the environment. And the new members that are flocking in, uh, Finland is clearly one of the people who will follow. Um, it, it, uh, and a kind of a reversal to the comfort and familiarity, as, as Gary was saying, of a Cold War politics. So we've been sort of struggling in the dark for the last 30 years, and there's something about the ease with which so many actors fall into position for this. Uh, that, that, is, that is a big, big concern. I just want to point, because I really want to address your comment. That's where, that's where our hearts and minds really are and should be. Um, and, and so I'm about to address Malta's question on the ICJ, you know, because it's really a bit of paper, um, what's happened there. And so for international lawyers, you know, the, the roar of the crowd, the grease paint, a, a colleague, very famous colleague of ours, who's a specialist in terrorism, you won't know her. <laughs> it was really sad the other day, because he was like, it was all about me and terrorism. Now you, Gary, and 
<laughs> to be friend Mona and Stephen are suddenly in the limelight. Yeah. So, 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 you know, it, 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 this is all a lot of, lot of chat about nothing in, in some respects. The ICJ judgment included, you know, what was the court to do? And it's actually David, yesterday, a conversation a couple of days ago with David, he alerted me to, to one of the declarations. Uh, because, you know, there is, this is an interest, interesting moment, and again, who cares, for international law, uh, where we get to sort of really unpick and unpack categories, and, and there's an energizing and invigorating aspect to, for the law to, to really con being confronted with, with issues like this and how we deal with them. And the court's role is one of them. What was the court to do? What was the, the Russian judge to send? And, oh, funny that. What was, was he to do? Uh, but there is an interesting question that comes in. But there's also these moments like Benuna, and this is from David alerting me to the fact that one of the judges, the Moroccan judge, says, explains that he voted in favour of the order in this case because I felt compelled by this tragic situation in which terrible, su terrible suffering is being inflicted on the Ukrainian people to join the call by the World Court to bring an end to the war. He actually didn't agree with the legal position. <laughs> Um, and that's really interesting that he actually expressly said that, um, that, you know, where the law ends and actually, yeah, yeah real life. Um, to come back to this as well, the, the interesting thing uh, was that in the beginning when this first happened, right, so when Canada was one of the first, uh, Canada didn't argue in legal terms pursuant to the trade rules. They argued about the violation to the people and the violations of international law that's happening on the ground in Ukraine. Uh, and so I think in this case, you know, what's interesting is it is, as Stephen's right, it is such a, a, a different, I'm looking at it in such a different way about what's happening in my rules. But so what could happen? Well, what we might see is Russia bringing a case against bringing a dispute to the WTO against those countries that have filed these invocations, it would be a very interesting one to see how they would characterize what has happened <laughs> and their responsibility, which in the previous dispute in 2014, which Ukraine and Russia were already at the WTO over transit restrictions that were imposed related to the initial invasion uh, of Ukraine in 2014, there they refused to characterize their, their responsibility refuse to provide any evidence. So we might see a reversal where actually governments would have to defend. The other question is how can, aside from the coordination that I think is crucial right now for governments to actually be talking about what they're gonna do about these sanctions and for how long, is to think about what they can propose. And this is the progressive sort of view that's coming out from, from several colleagues. Mulder, I think, is in my head because of foreign affairs that PC wrote is about thinking about how the trade rules need to address, you know, how governments need to be thinking about these trade rules if they want to help subsidize countries that are harmed and dealing with crisis, if they want to be able to address, you know, concerns with food prices and food security, and being able to have questions about certain elements, certain measures that governments are going to have to take to protect their people to be able to address this that may otherwise be inconsistent with the rules. And, and how you do that is actually talking to the governments and talking and having this coordinated. We very much didn't see that in March, 2020, when the pandemic hit and governments instantly began taking trade and you know, trade, not sanctions, trade action to be able to address the pandemic. And there, one of the key lessons from that was early coordination, early discussion would help protect the vulnerable countries. That's something. Well, um, these are really painful matters, but um, it's important that we're not alone with them. And it's, it's just great for us on this panel as colleagues to be in a room full of such engaged and intelligent students again. So um, thank you. And I now draw these proceedings to a conclusion. Thank you, everyone on the, on the screen as well, of course. Hi, Sarah. Well, I would be